Well, let's get started. Let's jump in. We got a good crowd here today. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, The Upside of Downsizing. I'm your host, Janet Barker Evans. And you know, downsizing doesn't have to be scary. It can be an opportunity to sift through your memories, connect with your kids, and define your legacy. So Matt Paxton, who's the host of PBS TV's The Legacy List, will join us for a conversation today about decluttering, dealing with family heirlooms, options for digitizing memories, and more as you prepare for the next chapter of your life. Okay, let's jump in and meet our speaker, Matt Paxton. Matt is one of the top downsizing and decluttering experts in the country. He is the host of the two-time Emmy-nominated series, Legacy List with Matt Paxton on PBS. And he was a featured cleaner on the hit television show Hoarders for 15 seasons. Matt is also the author of the best-selling book, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff. He started cleaning out houses after his father, stepfather, and both grandfathers died in the same year. And they're the reason that Matt's been working with families who struggle with hoarding and downsizing for 20 years. Matt appears regularly as a public speaker, a television, get, a television guest, a radio personality, helping families and companies find the upside of downsizing. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife and seven kids. Yes, seven. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. This is a great topic I know everyone's interested in. Thank you for giving me your time. Most importantly, I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll get right into it. All right. I think everybody knows who I am now. Most of people know me from Hoarders, all right? But I'm much more than that, okay? Uh, I've spent the last really 10 years focusing on downsizing. Um, and just because, quite honestly, I like the stories. I like a lot more of the stories. Uh, that's a lot more interesting. So we'll get into that today. Everybody's seen my book. Super excited about that. This is my TV show. I really want to stress this. When I left Hoarders, I knew that I wanted to make a positive television show about aging Americans. Sounds easy, right? I mean, I, I just, I knew the stories I was hearing in these houses were better than anything I could see on TV. And uh, every network on cable turned me down, except uh, Bravo wanted to know if there were any attractive granddaughters that would fight over the stuff. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure there is, but that's not the show I want Oh to my make. gosh, ratings. What? So yes, so everybody said no, nobody wants to see old people is what they told me. Uh, and now we've been nominated for two Emmys. And this year we were, uh, I'm very proud, we were up against Joanna Gaines, Marie Kondo, and wow. Oprah. Wow, that's uh, and remarkable, we, and, wow. We lost, we lost, as my mom said, she goes, I don't know that I'd spend a lot of money on the tickets to LA. <laughs> she goes, but that's really exciting. And I think the, the point of that here is, look, although we're all just starting to talk about downsizing, it's something we all are experiencing. And when we do talk about it, it's very emotional, very positive. And so I think that's what's exciting about this. All right, I have learned a lot in 20 years, and I'm gonna to try to share kind of the highlights over the next 30 minutes. Um, why do we hold on to things? I think that's really, really important. And we hold on to them um, because of the people and the emotions that are attached to it. It, it has nothing to do with the stuff, y'all. Uh, we don't love plastic, we don't love wood, we don't love nails. We love the people that are attached to it. I think that's really, really important. And it's the memories, that's why we hold on. And we hope these items are gonna bring us happiness. Now it does, but a majority of that happiness is temporary. It's short term right? because it brings us back to the people. And this is a super important, I really just want to stress this. Um, if this is the only thing you take away today, I'm okay with it. The stuff is a stepping stone from then to now. So many of us get stuck in the past when we're downsizing, like you're, you know, something in life has happened and you have to start cleaning. For me, I think mean, we talked about it. I lost my dad, my stepdad, and both my grandfathers. I had to clean all their houses. Um, I didn't want to do that. Life happened and I was left with that. And I think a lot of you are probably in that situation right now. I downsized two years ago, this time a little more positive. I fell in love and I had to move from Richmond, Virginia to Atlanta with my three sons. And so I had to get rid of all of my stuff that had been in my attic for 20 years. Um, and that's when I came up with this quote. And, and I'm going to throw a couple of quotes from the book in here. Um, when you find the item in your attic, remember it was a stepping stone. When you left it there, you needed it, but now you don't, you've grown. Um, we all know, we absolutely all know that you don't stop growing when you hit a certain age, right? And I'll argue you actually learn a lot more over 65. Um, some things you just can't get until you have some gray hair. Um, but this is an important, this is really important for you guys as you start this journey of downsizing. It's gonna help you let go. It got, some of that stuff got you through the 80s in the night, and it's easy to do with clothes, right? You can make fun of the clothes, you can laugh. But like when you get to some things that were really important, 
And uh, you have to remember, okay, it was a stepping stone. It got me here. It got me to the next point, but I don't need it now where I'm going. So I really want you to hold on to that. All right. How do we justify holding on to things? This is probably my favorite. We think we're going to need them. We think we might need them later. Uh, they were expensive. Yes, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, we think they're going to be worth a lot of money. Um, they're not, by the way, specifically the Longa Burger Baskets and the Beanie Babies. If we got to oh stop God. there, the Beanie Babies and the Longa Burgers are not. I once had a lady hand me a Longa Burger Basket with a bunch of Beanie Babies in it. And she's like, I'll, I'll pay you with this. And I said, no, no, I think we're good. All right, and here's the big one. We think that our kids or our grandkids will want this stuff someday. Does anybody uh, want to think? What, what, what do we, what's our thought on that? Do we think that our kids and grandkids want our stuff? I think that's the hope, too. I think people are like, I'm holding on to this. I want to give this cherished item, right? All right, so let's, family. yeah, let's talk about that before we move forward. We want people... We, we want people to want our stuff. What we really want is for them to remember us. We want to have value to them after we're gone. That's actually what's going on. And we do. You 100% have value to your kids. It just may not be the china, right? It may not be the china cabinet. It may not be the dining room. It might be somewhere else. And we're going to talk about that, all right? Um, I think we hold on to things because we have so many right? We have so many positive memories that we want to hold on to those things. And it, at some point, it becomes too much, right? And we have too many things. And it holds us back from moving forward. It holds us back from living. And that is what's happening right now to a lot of us, right? We have so much stuff that we can't go to a new community. We can't live, move in with our adult children. We like, like I had one lady, she had a, she finally got in right after the pandemic. She got into the community she's always wanted to get into. She was off the wait list. Her best friend had a condo next door. And she goes, I just got to go through all my pictures and then I can move in. And we were, and I looked at the pictures and I was like, this is going to take you three years to go through these pictures. And she had too much stuff. So, I, and I'm going to use humor a lot today. We have to, because if you don't use humor, this is a really sad subject. If you use humor, it actually is pretty easy to go through. All right, so we believe that when we die, this is our fantasy life, right? We believe that all these things, people are going to have this big dinner for us. They're going to have charger plates and candelabras and crystal and doilies. And I mean, look at this, the copper charger plates, there's everything here. And we think they're going to have this big, amazing dinner with all of our stuff to send us off when we're dead. All right, what I'm going to ask you now is how many of those dinners are happening now while you're alive? Almost none. If they don't make time for us now in the, in the dining room, they're not going to do it after we're dead. And the reality is we're leaving them with stuff that worries them. And I want to stress, it's not that they don't want your stuff. They just don't want that stuff. Okay? It's they don't want the stuff that you want them to want. They want other things. And we'll talk about that more in this presentation. All right. So how do we get started? All right. First thing, I want you to know your finish line. Where are you going? So many people call me and they say, oh, I got to start downsizing. Great. Where are you moving? Are you moving in with an adult child? Or are you moving into a new community? Where are you, are you going to a smaller house? What are you going to do? And they, oh, I don't know. And, and so I'm like, well, great. I can't help you downsize until you tell me where you're going. Because I need to know what that location is going to look like, what your life is going to look like. And it's really because you not only just for like space planning to know where you're going physically, but you have to decide, do I need all these things where I'm going? And I think the most important part is your why. I really like to. So you're going where? That's really important. And then your why. And your why is what's the real reason here? Am I moving uh, because it's a safer place? It has better health care. Am I using moving because uh, it has better food? Am I moving because it's closer to adult children and grandkids, like you've got to have your why. And I always compare this to, uh, for me, it's weight loss. I've, it's no secret. I've struggled with weight loss my entire life. And this is my 13 year old boy. And he, uh, one day, uh, he's asked me in bed, he said, Dad, are you going to die at the same age your dad did? And this is a 13 year old boy. And I said, well, no, I mean, why do, why do you ask? And he goes, well, I was doing the math. And anytime my son says I'm doing the math, it's, a, it's something interesting is going to come out of his mouth. And he goes, well, dad, you know, uh, your dad was 52. He goes, you're 47. He goes, dad, or is 46 at the time. He goes, dad, um, that's, you know, 
that's only six years from now. He goes, I'll still be in high school if you die then. And I said, yeah, man, um, I'm, I'm going to be here. You don't need to worry about that. And he goes, okay, well, then why do you eat all that food that you know is bad for you? So my why is I want to be a grandpa, right? My kid, I have seven kids and none of them have a grandfather. All their grandfathers are, are, have passed on. And so it's really important that I'm there for my kids. So my why is grandpa. Now, here's what's important about your why. Your why is what keeps you from quitting. Okay, that's why we're going here. Every t- I mean, because the two easiest things in the world to quit is working out <laughs> and cleaning. Because all you got to do is just not do it. All right. And that's why you're on this call. There's over 200 people here watching, which, by the way, I love those numbers. Thank you guys for coming. The reason you're all here is because we've quit at another time. Right. And it's really easy to quit. The why is going to keep you from quitting. I mean, I have it right here on my wall. It says why. So every time I'm working out, every time I want to give up, I just say to myself, grandpa, grandpa, grandpa. And so I need you guys to hold each other accountable for that. And that's what this is really about. This is an accountability slide. You have to hold yourself accountable. You can't just close the guest bedroom and say, eh, I'll do it tomorrow. Because if you do, you will never come back to it. So that's why the why is so important. And the why is personal and it's emotional. And you can't lie to yourself when you, when you say the why. So I want you guys all to really focus on your why. All right, step two, super important, start small. This is where a lot of us mess up. We try to come in and we try to like... Um, I mean, gosh, we try to do so much. And I want to try something here. If you're by your computer, if you're if you are typing, I want everyone to type in right now. How long have you been in your house? The house you currently live in? Have you been there 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Type it real quick. And I want to see what the numbers are. 20, you know, 35, 30, 38, 19, 38, one yeah. month, 23, 30, 37, 15, 32, 47, six weeks. We got it. We got the gamut here. I love it. I love it. So our average is around 25 guys. All right. Yeah. So it take, and we've got a lot over 30. And so I love this. Think about this, y'all. It's taken us 25 to 30 years to fill our house. Are we going to clean this out in a long holiday weekend? Is three days enough to clear out 30 plus years of memories? And by the way, most of you have 10 boxes that are still in your attic that you didn't unpack 30 years ago when you moved there. I was okay. going to say, the people that have been there 10 months, how much did you bring with you from the old place, right? Oh, and look, I've been moving people for 20 years, y'all. And so I always get to that one room where they're like, oh, what's in, like, what's in those boxes? I don't know. We packed them up when we moved from you know Tallahassee 30 years ago. And and they just, just send them because someone else paid to move them. So they're sending them again. They're going to go through them later. Um, this is the challenge. We get so big. This this job becomes so big and we start to avoid it that we never even get started. And so I want you to start small. And I mean really small. All right. I'm talking 10 minutes. I call it the 10-minute suite. This is it. And some of you are going to say, well, that's not enough. Actually, it is. Okay. Um, I put a junk drawer here because I want you to start with the junk drawer. I want you to start with... And the only thing that junk drawer is missing... Uh, is uh, a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon for 20% off. It's the blue one. You all know what I'm talking about. It expired a year ago. You all have most of them in that drawer. Now we and, might need now, it. We might yeah. need it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, well, that's why we, look, I've been in these houses, right? And you also have the red Folgers can that's filled with nails or pennies, right? Like I find them in everybody's house. And, I, and I'm just telling you, the best way to start is 10 minutes, right? And don't do more, don't do less. I want you to do 10 minutes a night every night, five nights a week. I like to do it around Jeopardy. I'll start around 7.50, right? And when Final Jeopardy is over, we hear the do, 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 do. I know I'm almost done. And I know that sounds silly, but it's achievable, y'all. It's doable. You can do it, okay? It's not about what you get done. It's that you did something, okay? You can prove to yourself that you can start. It's that you can accomplish something. Again, it is not what you finished. It's that you can finish. This is super important. And a lot of you, and I don't mean to give gender roles here, but a lot of the wives will say, okay, well, those 10 minutes, what'd you do the other 50 minutes? Don't focus on what you didn't do and don't focus on what you need to still do. This is about celebrating what you did that day. So few of us celebrate what we do. We're Americans, right? We put ourselves down. That's what we do. I want you guys to be proud of the 10 minutes a night that you do. That is enough to get started. And it's really about getting your confidence back up that you can do this. All right, we're going to focus on legacy. I love this. All right. Step three, obviously, the name of my TV show is Legacy List. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and a, a legacy list is a list of five or six items that matter the most, okay? And they're gonna tell your family's history. They're gonna tell your, really beyond you. They're gonna tell the whole story of your family. And I used to start, believe it when I started, when I started 20 years ago, I call this a fire list. If my house caught on fire, what are the five items I gotta have? Um, turns out no one's gonna watch a TV show called Fire List, all right? So I changed it to legacy list, but it, it's really a better word, all right? A legacy, the legacy list is all about how am I gonna tell this story in, about my family, right? And I love this. A legacy is it's the family story. It's the family lore, right? This is my grandpa and my grandma. I'm going to tell their the story about this moment. I love this moment. And my grandma always told it. My grandpa was an oil guy in Texas. Now, they lived actually in Oklahoma, in Mangum, Oklahoma. If anybody's from Oklahoma, it's where they have the rattlesnake convention every other year. Um, but then the hotel got infested with rattlesnakes. And so they had to shut down the hotel, true story. <laughs> and so they don't have a hotel in town anymore. Um, cause it's taken over by rattlesnakes, but they were hardcore farmers. They were really, really good people. And they would go fishing in Colorado. This is right on the Wyoming, Colorado border. And they'd go there every summer. And this was in the 50, late fifties. And my grandpa went in to buy worms and my grandma sat in the car, waited for him. She goes, you know, he was in there about 10 minutes longer than normal. And she goes, he came out and he goes, we're moving here. I bought the store. <laughs> and she said, okay. Wow. Right? And that's, that's the country store. They had that store for 25 years. And um, that was their life. And they lived off the land. They were basically homesteaders. They would hunt their own food. They would grow their own food. Um, but that's a legacy. That's the family lore. Okay. Do I know that that's exactly how the story happened? Probably not. I don't know, no, my grandparents, it's possible. But the story has been told over and over and over. And that's how you build a legacy is by telling those stories. And so I love that. And that's really what a legacy is, right? It's the power of the story. And I love that. The, the, the legacy is the power of the story. Because guys, everyone on this call, we're all gonna die at some point, okay? We will all die. And you only live on if people are telling the stories about you. So the really crazy eccentric people on here, guess what? We live on a lot longer than the boring people do, all right, because our stories are memorable. We might be a pain in the butt when we're alive, but we live on forever, all right? And my kids can finish the stories about my grandparents and my dad, and they've never even met them. Think about it. They've never even met them, but yet they That's can finish awesome. those stories. It's because That's the awesome. stories were told, all right? The story is the legacy, not the item. Let's sit on that again. The story is the legacy, not the item. So many of us are focusing on what? the items. It's not about that. This is my mom's cookbook. This is a great example. Uh, right after my dad died, my mom went back to all the women in our family. And she got, by the way, this is my, if you can see it on the far right, that is my grandmother's apricot pie recipe. If you can screenshot now is the time to do it because this is the best apricot pie in the world. Um, but my, my mom went around for two years, went around the country and she got, it's not all she did, but she did it over the two years. And she got all the recipes from all the women that raised me and they're handwritten. That's my mom's handwriting. And some of them are in my grandma's handwriting. And some of them are in, uh, she even got all the ladies at church, the church I grew up in. And so all the dishes that were served at our, at our, you know, at our luncheons on Sundays, they're all in this book. And then my mom gave it to me. So now I have all these. Now, fast forward 20 years later, this year, I'm sitting in a kitchen with my four Korean stepsons, right? And it's three, three boys, one girl. And I'm teaching them how to make these apricot pies. And they're asking me stories about my dad and my grandma and all the women that they're seeing these recipes for. And I'm getting to tell stories about these women that died 15, 20 years ago. And these young boys are now learning about these really strong, powerful, amazing women that raised me. These are amazing story starters, right? The legacy is what these women were. And even the legacy is my mom doing it. That's another part of the story, right? But it's all based upon a piece of paper. Is the paper the legacy? No, it's the stories behind it. I think it's really, really important. How do we tell, we are gonna spend a minute on this. This is new that I've added to this, this presentation because people say, well, I don't know how to tell the story. I'm not a good storyteller. They're like, Matt, you're a great storyteller. You do it all the time. And that's true, I'm a really good storyteller, but I wasn't when I started, I had to learn. And so I wanna make sure I'm teaching you guys how to do this, all right? You gotta have someone to tell the story to. I cannot stress that enough. Can you do it on Zoom? Yep, you're all on Zoom today. So you could have a Zoom night. It's very possible, okay? 
Um, you want to get the grandkids. This is the step you want to get the grandkids involved because they care more than you realize. They may not act like it, but they're the ones that are going to hang on every word. Right? Get the grandkids involved. Your adult son who lives in California, he's heard them a thousand times, okay? But his son wants to hear it. Right? Um, even strangers, I want to stress on this one. So many people at church or neighbors, friends, they say, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Believe it or not, this is where I say, yeah, actually you can. I'm going through a box of pictures. Will you come over and listen to my stories? I know that sounds weird. I know it sounds really weird, but that's a pretty effortless way for a friend to help. And believe it or not, they'll think your stories are insanely fascinating. All right? So don't be afraid to let a stranger, or not a total stranger, don't go in the middle of the street and be like, hey, um, hey man, you want to come to my house and listen to stories? But if someone asks how they can help, that's a really good way they can help to have them come over and listen to your stories. All right? Document it anyway anyhow, anywhere, write it down, take your cell phone. Everybody has an audio. It, it, just, it looks like a microphone on this. If you click on that and hit record, you can record it into your, into your phone. You can do videos. I use this app called Artifacts. Check it out, Artifacts. It lets me take a picture of the item that lets me write out all the information and then it lets me record a video or an audio and it's all held there together. Um, I'm not saying you have to use that, but that's what I happen to use. But I love a lot of these ways. But even if you just write it down, you got to get it down on paper or an audio somehow. Right? Don't get stuck on the details. This is where a lot of people get stuck. A lot of us over 55 think that we're supposed to be perfect. Guess what? You're over 55 and you're not perfect yet. So we're probably not going to achieve that. Okay. So why does this story have to be perfect? The trying to be perfect is what is holding you back. Just write it down. Get the story out however you remember it. I am going to argue if it is perfect, it's not very good. All right. Just don't make it hard. Start with whatever you remember. All right. What is it? How did you get it? Who gave it to you? Um, what do you remember about that day? What smells and sounds do you remember? Believe it or not, that picture of the country store that my grandparents had, I can still smell it. I can smell the wood in that store. I can smell the peanuts boiling in the back. I can hear the cowboy boots stomping on the wood. I know exactly what it sounded like. And there was a bell on the door that would ring every time someone would open the door. And then the door would slam shut too fast and too loud. But I remember those are the things I remember. Right? You all have little things that you remember. That's what you need to write down. And this is the cool part. Memories start more memories. Right? You may not, when you sit down, there's going to be things you don't remember when you sat down, but because you start to write these stories down or you start to tell these stories, you're gonna to start to remember everything. Right? So memories start memories. And it, you can hear my excitement about this y'all because it really is awesome to get into these stories because you're gonna to start to tell things like you haven't remembered in 30 years. And you're gonna be like, oh my gosh. Like one, I had one lady I said, um, she goes, I'm not very good at stories. I said, great. I said, um, what was your first job that you got paid for? And she starts to tell me, I said, what did you get paid? And she was like, oh, it's 10 cents a day. And now the granddaughter was sitting in the room. She's like, 10 cents a day. And then that started a whole conversation. And I, and I got out of the way. You just got to get started, y'all, because these memories are going to create more memories and more questions. And that's how it, the ball starts rolling. All right. Now we've talked about it. We're, we're starting to get the stories together. Now we got to let go. You have to document and tell these stories. All right? You got to share the story. It's super important to share the story. This is my 96-year-old grandma. And this is my youngest son. Um, they are both still very alive and very in love with each other. And she tells him stories all the time. Now, this lady was 45 when I was a kid, when I was his age. All right, now she's 96. Um, maybe she's 40-something with me. The stories I remember about her are about her bike riding and skiing and hiking with us because she was a young mom. Um, the story I always tell here is um, she was very disappointed that I did not want her fine china. She was, I mean, really, really disappointed. She had to move into a senior living community. Um, she was super disappointed that none of us wanted the china. And I said, well, Nanny, what I really want is your bike. And she's like, well, my bike, what do you mean? And I told her the story of the day uh, that we went bike riding. My brother and I and her went bike riding. We lived in a really cool neighborhood in Richmond, Virginia. And at the back of the hill was this thing, uh, back in the neighbor's thing called um, Dead Man's Hill. All right? It was like straight out of the movie Stand By Me. It was this very, um, very romantic, big, large hill. And the story was some kid uh, fell off his bike and died on the hill. 
I've got no proof of that. I've looked. I don't think it actually happened. But some kid told another kid, told another kid, and we've all believed it our whole life. Well, my brother and I were very clearly not allowed to ride our bikes down Dead Man Hill. We were not allowed to ride down Dead Man's Hill. So we created a very funny situation where we would hit our brakes when we got to the top of Dead Man's Hill, and my grandma would fly down that hill. And so we were like, we don't care if we get in trouble, we're doing it. So we did it. And as we were going as fast as we could, we're like, Grandma, you can't get to the you can't get to the end of the street as fast as us. And she's very competitive still to this day. And so we knew that she would go really fast. So we did. And we slammed our brakes at the top of the hill. And she just went Woo! all the way down the hill, screaming and yelling and getting mad. And then it took her about an hour to get back. By the way, it was a summer day in Richmond, Virginia. So it was about 100 degrees. And her hair, she just got her hair done. Her hair got all upset. She was very, very, very upset. Long story short, she ends up about an hour later, comes back to us screaming, super mad at us, right? And we laughed and laughed. And she had our, she had beginning of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and so she would smack, she would uh, spank us, and it just tickled. Honestly, it was like a feather, and we it made us laugh more. And the whole moral of the story here is, I loved hanging out with my grandma. Man, she was awesome. She was hilarious. She was fun, and I remember that bike. I don't remember a lot of the fancy meals. Right. And I said, Nanny, I love that story. I tell that story all the time. You were an awesome grandma. You were fun. You know, everyone else's grandma was old and stood in the corner with her purse, like, and put her hands through her purse strap so that someone in the family wouldn't steal her purse. And I was like, you're out riding bikes with us. Like, this is awesome. And she goes, oh, that old ratty bike is in the, in the basement. And I was like, great. And so I took the emblem off the front of the bike because that's what I wanted to keep. I mean, sometimes you've got to, if you're not, if you're the kid, right now, if you're the adult child that's watching this today, um, a lot of times it's the oldest adult daughter who is watching. And if that's you, you need to be able to speak up and start saying what you want, because that's really important. Right? And I say this to my grandma all the time. You may be the last person with the knowledge of some of these stories. I hate the word obligation. I do not, because obligation is normally something we put upon ourselves, not what other people put on us. I don't really, it's a negative word for me. But here's the deal. The only obligation you do have, I do believe sometimes you're the only one who knows who's in that picture. You're the only one who knows some of these stories. So I really want you to encourage you to start telling these stories. Okay. Uh, this is my favorite story. I have to tell this one really quick. This is a lady I helped, Miss Lennis. Um, we were going through her house. Miss Lennis is obviously the lady on the left. And uh, you always find a picture of grandma when she was, uh, was a lot younger. And we found this picture. We were in the room was her, her adult grandchild who's like 18, and then her adult child and her. And we found this picture. And the first thing the girl said was, that's not grandpa. Who is that? And she goes, oh, that's Armando. She goes, he was very handsome. He was my lover. <laughs> and, and she's like, anyway, and she goes to go to the next picture. And we're like, no, 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 no. We want to know more about Armando. And we start to hear the story. She goes, well, when I, when I, you know, when I was a, a child, I actually taught uh, art history at MIT. She goes, I was the first female adjunct professor at MIT. And I met Armando, he was a Spanish professor. And she goes, and then, you know, we had to all go to the war. And she starts to talk and, she, and, and, and the daughter goes, well, wait a minute, or the granddaughter goes, wait a minute, you were a professor at MIT? And she goes, I was the first female professor at MIT. She goes, it was an adjunct, but yes. And she goes, I just thought you just went there. In this picture of handsome Armando is what let this granddaughter know that her grandma was a total badass. Right? Sometimes the memories create memories, y'all. Right? You have to tell the stories. Uh, this is Lennis now. She's still a looker. Uh, she refused to take the fur jacket off the entire clean out. She kept her gloves and her jackets on. I just love this woman. She's one of my favorite people in the world. All right. We've talked about just getting started. It's super, super important. Somehow, some way, just tell one story. And I think you guys can do that tonight. I want you to practice. Start telling the stories. All right. Another great opportunity we're going to have um, of letting go and, and getting through the house is donating. I really want to focus on donation over selling. Okay. Um, you will never be happy with the amount of money that you receive for the items you sell. Because all of us have been told by our parents and our grandparents that this is very fine china. It was very, very nice. It was nice furniture. And it probably was when they bought it. But times are different now and things cost different things. Um, expect, believe it or not, 10 to 25 percent of what you paid for it that's what you're going to get when you sell it right and if you've ever seen my tv show legacy list we don't ever talk about the financial value because the financial value doesn't matter 
I mean, it's the emotional value that matters. And the minute you put a price on that, it now gives you an excuse to not let go of the item. If you're like, oh, well, someone offered me 50, but it's worth 100. You never want it. You've already made the decision to get rid of the item. And when you put a price on it, it makes you come backwards. Right? And if the goal is to clean your house out and have a better life, do we really need to fight over 30, 40 bucks? I can't tell you how many times I've seen people not empty a house because they're upset about the money that was offered for it. I'm telling you, with 20 years experience, you're never going to be happy with what you get. All right? I want you to ch change that mindset. And you always be happy with donating. I can't tell you how awesome it is on the donation. I want you to change your mindset from what if I need that later to what if someone else needs it now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there that need the things you don't really care about. And it makes their life significantly better. Do you really need 100 bucks? Couldn't giving someone some tools from your garage change their life? It could. You know, do that. Find someone that'll appreciate the items as much as you did or you loved it. All right. And I think this is really important with like your parents stuff. What if your like dead relatives gives you things that you feel obligated to keep? I mean, this is a great, but you don't have any emotional tie to it. Well, find someone that would. Find someone that would appreciate it. Donate it to them. And it would make the person that gave it to you happier as well. Um, I've never seen someone regret donating an item because the emotional satisfaction giving generates always outweighs whatever loss is felt. Um, I believe this to be true. That's why I put it in my book. Mm -hmm. The joy of donation will always outweigh, always outweigh the joy of, of cash. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I have to say, I work with uh, Goodwill. It's really important for me to be fair. I'm not saying you have to use Goodwill. I use Goodwill because of their workforce development program. They put a lot of people to work, and I like that. That's what matters to me. I want you to find out whatever charity matters to you, but you have to really align with their mission, okay? Whatever it is, it has to be something you really believe in because if you do that, then you're going to want to give away more and more and more. Right? But it's got to be the one that works for you. So, so do a little research and find the one that works for you. Right? Decluttering mistakes that we make. These are fun ones. All right. We focus on the reality. Um, where we, I want you to focus on the reality, not your fantasy life. So many of us focus on our fantasy life. Um, that's very easy. That's like keeping your, oh, well, I'll start with clothes. These are, this is my closet. Okay. So let's follow it from the right side all the way to the left. All right. This is when I uh, moved last year. Those are size 28 on the right. And then as we go left, they're 30s. Then there's some 32s. There's a couple 34s. And then we get to 36s, right? There's 30 pair of pants in that closet. Only three of them fit me. That was size 36, right? I was holding on to 28s, 30s, 32s, and 34s because I believed somehow with seven kids, I was going to find all this extra time to work out and be healthier. And I was going to lose 50 pounds. Is that realistic? No. Right? Your fantasy life is what you wished it would be, not what it actually is. Start to be realistic with yourself, y'all. Be brutally honest and get rid of the clothes that don't fit you. I was able to donate all, I mean, literally 27 pair of pants. Right? That makes a difference. And now all of a sudden my closet has three pair of pants in it. It's actually pretty awesome. It's easy to get ready in the morning. All right, this includes workout equipment, all right? Skis, bikes. Uh, man, the one that kills me is when I get into um, ice skates and roller skates when I find in an 85-year-old's house. I'm like, you're going to go ice skating anytime? Maybe. Or the crib. I love it when I find the crib in the attic. And I'm like, oh, okay, Miss Jones, you're going to have a baby anytime soon? How old are you? I'm um, 89. <laughs> I think we can get rid of the crib. All right? Fantasy life really can hold you back. All right? And this includes yarn, paintbrushes, magazines. That includes, guys, you're not going to like this. That includes your time life in your National Geographic magazines. They don't have resale value and you're not gonna read them all again, right? And yes, it includes everything in the dining room. Right? You're not having that big dinner again. It's not realistic. And the 25 board, I, I can't stress on the board games. If it doesn't have all the pieces, you can let it go, y'all, right? Okay, I'm gonna let everyone read this one for one second. I'm gonna just pause, let you read it, and then we'll address it. All right. A lot of us feel a guilt for holding on to things from dead people. This is a touchy subject. AARP did not want me to put this quote in the book. And I was like, dude, I have to. Like, it's one of the biggest things. Guilt is something we all feel. when, And it's really an over 55 thing, I'll be honest. 
Um, the kids under 55, they do not feel guilt on this subject, but over 55, we really, really do. Um, I prom and, and my mom, it always came to my family with, well, what will your grandfather think? And I was like, I don't think he cares. He's been dead for like 25 years. Like, I think he's fine with it. I think there's other things I've done in my life that are more important than me throwing away his golf clubs, okay? Um, I really want you guys, it's okay to let it go. You do not need to carry that guilt, right? We are holding on to stuff that our parents made us keep. And honestly, they made, their parents made them keep. And I always, I put this, the wooden couch, right? That has the rolling wooden back and it's in the room. You're not allowed to go into except on Christmas day. And it's got plastic on top of it. Your mom didn't want it. And now she's making you take it. And we call that punting. All right. I want you guys to free yourself from this. It's really, really important. All right. Um, how do you find out if your loved ones want an item? It's real simple. You got to ask them. Right. And when they say, oh, you know, they say, no, I don't want it, mom. And you say, oh, OK, well, she's young. She doesn't know what she wants yet. I'll hold on to it for a few more years. Hopefully some of you are laughing by me saying that because you've said that in your head. I will I will argue if they've said twice that they don't want it, then give it to someone else that does. Someone else in the family will want it. Someone else will care about it more. Give it to somebody else. It's OK. It's your item. You can do what you want. Right? No spite items. Um, this is really important. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had families that are fighting over grandfather clocks or pianos, and you find out um, that they don't actually care about the item. They just don't want their sister to have the item. <laughs> and so like, it always comes back to, well, dad loved me more than he loved you or something. And people are fighting, it has nothing to do with the item, right? Don't hold on to an item if you don't actually want it. Give it to someone in your family that does. This uh, was it Le Croissette. This is a great bowl. When I got divorced uh, five years ago, I knew that my, my, my first wife, by the way, we're very good friends. She lives up the street. Um, we're really good friends now. But she wanted that bowl, and I wanted that bowl. And I kept, I didn't actually want the bowl. I had never used it. I didn't want her to have it. And so I got the bowl in the divorce. And then when my, uh, my, my now wife <laughs> found out that I kept that bowl for, for negative reasons, she said, no, you got to get rid of it. And so I actually wrapped it up and gave it to my ex-wife for Christmas one year. And she's like, when she opened up, she's like, I never wanted this bowl. I just didn't want you to <laughs> have it. And so now we keep passing the bowl back. But here's the best part. No one's ever actually used that bowl. It's never been used. Apparently, it's a very nice dish, but we've never used it. Guys, this is an opportunity to downsize is an opportunity to have a really amazing positive experience. Don't let spite and negativity enter that space. You, know, you have a real chance here to, to be positive. Um, give stuff away, man. If you don't absolutely need it or, or want it right away, give it away. And you don't need it. All right, leave the negativity to home. This is probably my favorite one. Buying more stuff to get rid of stuff is not productive. All right, that includes baskets and boxes and more bins and more uh, vacuums. I can't tell you how many people go out and say, well, I'm going to start downsizing, so I'm going to go buy a bunch of organizing supplies. Um, that is not productive. Buying more to get rid of, <laughs> to have less does not make mathematical sense. All right? um, it's really a way to avoid doing it. And we do the same thing in exercising. We go out and we buy the pants, we buy the shoes, we buy all the outfits, we buy all the machines. And we're so tired from carrying all the stuff in from the car that we got at Target that we don't exercise. All right? Same mentality. You're not gonna, you have enough stuff in your house to get rid of it. All that, if you open the pantry and all those old uh, brown paper bags you got from the grocery store, you can carry most of your donations out in that, okay? You have the supplies in your house. Don't spend your time planning for it or buying for it, right? So this is it, you can have less y'all. I mean, I wanted to be really, really quick here. You can focus on your finish line and your why. You're gonna start small. You're gonna create that legacy list. You're gonna tell your stories. Donation, donation, donation. I promise you, it'll become addictive. You will love donating, right? And then leave that guilt at home. That guilt is holding you back from the new future life that you really can have. Um, I, I always tell this story. Um, I had a guy one, a couple years ago, I moved and his wife had just passed away. He was a new widow. He was really upset about moving. And he, and he had been in a house 50 plus years. We helped him clean out that whole house. He had just lost his wife. His kids were all separate parts of the country. And we ran into him six months later in the community, we're moving someone else. And I said, hey man, how's it going? Like, I was really worried about, it. I was like, did, he, did we make the right decision? Was it the right place for him to go? 
And I said, how's it going? He's like, man, life is pretty good. He goes, I can dance uh, and I can drive. He goes, I'm having a good time. And he, there was nothing romantic. He didn't want that. He was just enjoying life again. And so I do want to tell people, um, a lot of us let the stuff be the reason we don't move forward. Don't. There's a, it, it's, life's a lot better uh, on the other side. I mean, I move, if you read my book, the, the punchline is I, I moved from the town I lived in for 46 years. And me and my three sons moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, there were a few items I was having a hard time leaving. Like I did not, I, I really struggled with the decision. And someone the other day said, well, what did you, what items did you, what were you struggling with? And a year later, I don't even remember. I got a, I got a busy life now. Like my kids are in music and marching band and we've got friends now. Like I have a life again. And so don't let that stuff hold you back. Cause it's, it's just life is better with less. All right. And I think, I hope you guys heard one thing. I said a lot of things really fast. Cause I want each of you to find here one thing that stuck for you. And I want you to, when you hang up today, I want you to get started. Go work for 10 minutes. You can do it for 10 minutes. And I think we're going to go to questions. Is that right? Yes, we are. First, we're going to pop up a slide to show where you guys can learn more about Matt and follow him. Uh, so if we can pop that slide up, all of his social feeds and everything, this is where you can follow him and learn more and keep learning from Matt, which is awesome. And now is the time to hear from all of you. So we already have a couple coming in. Okay. And the first one, this is a good one. I have a bunch of videos. I want to get them digitized, but I don't know what I need to do. It'll be too costly. What do you recommend? And, and this is a big one for a lot of people. I found 1930s films and had them digitized. And, and then what do you do with them? So this is a great, uh, great question coming in. Okay. So digitization is a great answer, but you're right. It's expensive. Uh, it is expensive. Um, so you have two options. You can actually um, get a converter. If you are, if you are proficient in, with technology, um, a digital converter, which is, it's an old VHS, and, you know, it looks like the old VHS winders and you put them in there and then uh, it'll convert it right to a digital file. They're pretty inexpensive. Honestly, they're probably a like hundred bucks. You can buy one of those online, have a, have a family member help you buy it. And then you can just do the work yourself. If that is not realistic, then I would just focus on the, on the ones that actually matter. Like try to find four or five and then convert them pay for those to be done. There's a bunch of good services out there to convert the videos. Um, I like PhotoMine. Some people like um, Legacy Box. They're, they're good, but they're very expensive. There's a lot of groups out there. Um, do your research, look at the reviews. Make sure the reviews say that they turn it back in a timely fashion and, and you know, you're happy with it. Um, but you're right, digitization is amazing, but it's not cheap. And so just, I would really make sure uh, oh, this lady's saying Walmart offers the service. I didn't know that. That's wonderful. I mean, there's a lot of groups out there doing it. Um, just do the research to make sure that they do a good job. Um, but I think you're going to have to prioritize which ones matter most. And I think if you're not comfortable with the technology, because you're right, there are converters. Maybe you have a grandson or a granddaughter or a daughter, or somebody mm -hmm. that could do it with you, which is another really great way to share the story of it. I love it. Actually, that's a good idea. I mean, you say, hey, look, it's going to cost me a hundred bucks to convert this. I'd rather pay you, man. Right. Yeah. You know, if it costs you 500, tell your grandson it only costs you 100 and they'll take it. Right? <laughs> like, don't go market rate. But the, the reality here is, I love that. Get the grandkids involved. I mean, they can do it. And, and, and then you're right. You have to tell the story. Yeah. Brian's saying his parents give him all this stuff to convert, which is great, though. You know, yeah. it doesn't help being on a, in a place where so no one can see it, you know. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Is there a website or a list of questions that you know that can help trigger the memories or stories we want our loved ones to share? Maybe something similar to StoryWorth. She said, I don't think my family will type out their stories, but I could definitely record them sharing them on a Zoom. Yeah, so I love the Zoom. That's what I do. It's the easiest way. Get all the family members on. There's two things that happen there. And I do have 20 questions in my book. I call them story starters. Um, and no one ever gets to number 20. I'll tell you that right now. Um, what I really encourage is like the first one is who was your best friend growing up? Right? Literally, who was your best friend growing up? These are for grandma, kids to grandma, right? Uh, what was your first job? What did you get paid? What was your first car? And then what did your, what town, where'd you live, grow up and what did it look like? Believe it or not, if you get past those, right? Oh, also what did, uh, to grandma, what did you do in high school for fun? No one... For some people never know, like grandma was a, like a state champion basketball player, right? And they just can't fathom that. 
ask very basic questions. But doing it on Zoom does two things. One, it gets everyone else. Remember, memories start memories, all right? Members, memories create memories. So people are going to start asking questions. And it puts a timestamp on everybody visually. And so when you go back and look at this in 10 years, it'd be like, oh man, look, Uncle John has hair. Oh my God, I didn't know, you know, like, and this is Pete before he was married. Like it, and they're like, oh my, like my kids have never seen a video of my dad. I never took a video of my dad. I realized that the other day. They have a picture, but they don't even, they've never seen him. They've never heard him talk, right? And um, those are the things that really matter. So I think keep it real simple. There's no cost to that Zoom other than having the Zoom thing. And just, you're basically getting all the family together on a Sunday afternoon and they can do it from anywhere in the country. And you guys did it today. You already proved that you did it. You know, just start with those five questions and that's all you need. That's great. It's easy to record the Zoom and keep it too. Yeah. So that's great. Okay, here's a great question from Cookie. How do you handle gifts that your children have given you and you have absolutely no use for? I've held on to them due to guilt. Ah, uh, so that's a tough one. Um, I love it. Yeah, donate it. To, someone's answering it before us. I love it. <laughs> Don't be afraid to donate it um because they're they're gonna find out that you got rid of it when you're dead so you're good right i mean don't worry about it they're not gonna uh they're not gonna care really donate it i would also say hey offer to you say hey man i don't i'm downsizing blame it on the moves that i'm downsizing i gotta get rid of 75 percent of my stuff and i use that that number on purpose i always say 75 percent because you can say to the kids hey do you want it back or I mean, I love it, and I've taken a picture of it. I put it on my legacy list. It's amazing to me. I love the story, but I really have to get rid of it. I'm either going to donate it, or do you want it back? And then it puts it back on them. If they want it, then you need to say, "Great, you must come get it by X date." And this deadline is what's really important. So many of us, our houses have turned into storage unit for our adult children. Be very clear on the time frame. If you don't pick it up by X date. I'm going to donate it. You're not, it's not on you to give it to them. Put it on the get on the younger kids to come pick it up. It's not your job to go deliver it. Just say, here you go, guys. Come get it. If they don't, donate it. But you're communicating and just communicate openly. Say, I loved it. Thank you. I put it on my legacy list. It's amazing. And then move on. They're not going to care. Trust me. The most of the things we feel guilty about, you're going to be shocked. The kids will be like, oh yeah, no, I don't want it. Give it away. It's interesting if you go into a Goodwill too, I mean, especially some of the younger folks, they mm -hmm. love going and finding stuff that they love. And when you donate to those organizations, it's somebody's going to find your item that's going to love it. You know, people are going to love it. Know. Not only that, but they're getting jobs, by the way. You're putting yes, jobs. They I mean, get jobs and people come in and they I, love your stuff and they give it a home and they use it. I'll say this. The things that I usually see grandkids wanting is the jewelry and the vintage clothes. That's and that's yeah. typically what they want. And like the watches and like it's always smaller than a bread box. Um, give your closet a ch let grandkids come go through the closet real quick. And you get amazing stories. Like they're like, when did you wear this, Grandma? Oh, I wore it, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to tell the story. That's an amazing opportunity for story time. Um, but you also have some cool stuff in your closet that you don't know is cool. The grandkids know it's cool. You don't know it's cool. So give them a chance. If they don't come do that, then donate. That's a that's a great, that's a great idea. Let them in, let them come see it. Uh, here's another question. A lot of older folks take a painting in their later years. Any mm -hmm. idea where, how you can donate these things? Yeah, the frames and the tools are usually worth more than the actual painting. Uh, we, this happens a lot. Um, also, don't be afraid to sell it. Put it on Facebook Marketplace. Just because Grandpa painted it, um, art sells very well at 50 to 100 bucks. You'd be amazed. Uh, I sell a lot of stuff on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, I sell a lot of stuff on EBTH, everything but the house. Um, yep, Amber's right. Amber just wrote, uh, donate some of them to a, a local senior living community or um, a lot of kids art, uh, like kids art classes. There's a lot of those popping up around the world. I cannot stress. They love the old paintings you have on canvases because they just paint over them. They let the kids paint over them and start new. And so it's like giving them a free canvas. And so, I, I mean, I'll tell you, I've had the most success donating to uh, as art supplies to other groups. And think about it, you're gonna have younger kids that can't afford these supplies are getting to use your supplies and your canvases. Some will be inspired by the paintings, some will not, but they will go to good use. I, we even had a group that took a lady's china collection. She had like 30 some sets of china and they ended up taking it, cracking it up and turning it into mosaics. And the kids used it to make pottery and that made her feel good. I mean. Don't be afraid to call these places and find out what they're using it for. And if it makes you happy, then it's a great place to donate. 
Here's another great question coming in from Lisa. How can I tell? Hey, I'm sorry to cut you off. This lady just said something really interesting. She said um, that she is she is finding the ability. Now, some, yeah, some of you are really good artists. Some of you are not. And I want to say that on both sides. All right. But she said she had some needlepoint that were partially finished and she was able to sell on eBay. Um, absolutely. Do not think that your stuff is not sellable. If you know you don't want it, specifically on the cart, arts and crafts, if you want to donate it, great. But if you need to sell it or you feel like you should, test the waters, see what happens, because you'll be amazed how much you can you can get out of that. I mean, we just had a house the other day where she's like, it's all my costume jewelry. It's not worth anything. And I go, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, man, we got $8,000 from a, um, a jewelry store on the gold and all the all the different jewelry she, the kids didn't want and she didn't want it. She thought it was just costume jewelry. She got an extra $8,000. So don't think it's, don't always assume it's nothing. Um, Lisa has a question. How can I tell if my mom has a hoarding issue and how do I bring that up in conversation? Okay, this is a, we could do a whole hour on this and I've spent most of my career on the hoarding. Um, how can you tell? Well, she's not letting you in the house. She's coming to meet you. Uh, when you go to pick her up, she meets you in the driveway. One of you is now realizing, oh my God, I haven't been in my mom's house in three years. Right? That's one of the challenges. Um, look in the trash cans. Uh, if she takes uh, food every time you guys go out to eat and she brings it all, everybody's food home, you'll start to see those things. When do you ask? Okay, this is, this is my, one of my favorite tips. If you can see the mess, it's not the time to ask the question. That needs to be at a different time. When you're away from the house, you're doing something happy, something positive, bring it up and say, hey, I, I wanna remind you, I love you. That's why I'm asking this question. So many times hoarding or any type of, of mess that is challenging in our life, we bring it up at the wrong time. And so I wanna really, if you can see the mess, you shouldn't talk about it. Do it at a different time. Go for a walk, get ice cream, get coffee, get away from the mess, talk about what's going on, remind them that you love them. Um, and don't ever say, if you love me, you'll clean up the house. Cause it's not that simple. They can't help it. Um, hoarding is a absolute mental disability. They cannot help it. It's a protected mental disability now under the DSM five. Like it's real. It's not a choice. They can't help it. There's a reason they do it. We could talk for hours about this. Um, but go online. I do have another book I wrote called secret lies of hoarders that really goes into the brain of hoarding, but I would really focus on, um, why reminding them why you love them and that you want them safe. Yeah. And, and, and that's it, but don't do it around the mess. Cause they do that. They're going to fight you and it's going to get real negative real fast. Uh, we have a question from Debbie and it's similar to a couple other comments. People have said, what do I do when there are no heirs? I have no heirs. I have family stuff. I have photo slides. What do I do with all that? Okay. And this happens a lot. So there are no heirs left. You're the last one. Um, I think this is an opportunity to change someone's life. Okay. Either through a charity that you like or a church group, but find somewhere where you can really make a difference. Um, there are people out there that need help, that need your things, and you can make their life much better. And I promise, I'm not, I'm not going to make this ridiculous statement that you're going to find a new family. I don't mean it like that. But you will have a moment of joy when you give this stuff away. And we see it a lot. It gives you some purpose. Um, but you also need some help. Let's talk about that. If you, if you have no heirs, you have no one else to help, we need help doing that. So find the the types of people. Refugee organizations is an amazing place. Catholic Charities is another one that we do that with. Um, a lot of, I do a lot with like um, abused women shelters where they've left home with nothing. Like I can't stress how amazing that is. We had a group that um, a lady called us. She said, someone's house burned down. They have nothing. And we matched them with a lady that, that had no heirs, exact situation. And I said to her, I said, hey, would you want to, you know, we donate this whole house. They have nothing. Their whole house just burned down. And she's like, well, if I can be there, I would love it. And she's still friends with them. Um, she still communicates with them. And I think she even went to one of like Thanksgiving dinner or something with them. They were so appreciative. I promise you that this is an opportunity to change strangers' lives, which is almost, they appreciate it more than family. <laughs> so I really want you to, 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 to give it a chance to think that this is an opportunity to change lives and not just the, the, the it does suck that all the heirs are gone and it, it's really hard. And, and it's about probably half of our clients now. So you're not alone. So reach out and start talking to people and you'll be amazed how many people, one, want to communicate with you and two, want to help you. Uh, here's another great question. My dad is in memory care with Alzheimer's. We still have his condo full of everything he had. I'm anxious to start cleaning out the place to get ready to sell, even though I'm incapable of cleaning on my own house, LOL. Uh, my siblings, seem very reluctant to start the project, possibly because he's still alive. How do I get them to take those first steps? 
Whew, this is a tough one and a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, whoever is, if you are the, um, what's the word, the legal, not heir, but the legal, um, if you're in charge legally of the, of the will, then you need to say, you, you actually have a financial responsibility. You have a legal responsibility to speed that up because you are spending the money of the estate. Thank you, executor. Um, there's one when you're alive and then after they pass away, you become the executor. Um, but whoever is in charge of that person while they're alive, they have a legal obligation to keep that money uh, as tight as possible for all the future heirs. And um, the, the sad truth is power of attorney. Thank you. POA, power of attorney. That's it. So the P, whoever's the POA right now, that's when they're still alive. So that's the person that has the legal power to do it. But they have a financial responsibility to make this happen. So I would go that route, not saying, hey, we're going to sue you, saying, hey, I'm nervous about um, there's a lot of more money for dad's care if we actually go through this. What's happening is they're sad. They don't want to admit that, that dad's not coming back. And the reality is dad's not coming back. If he's already in the memory care, it's done. All right, it's not going to get better. And so you just have to have that hard conversation. But back to the hoarding answer, you got to have that hard conversation, not in dad's room in front of him. You got to have that conversation when people are not screaming and yelling. You got to have that question, that conversation at a positive time. Um, it's really hard, man. It, the, there's nothing worse than watching someone you love go through. Uh, I've, I've dealt with both dementia and, and people dying. My dad died very quickly. He had six weeks to live. Man, that was better than watching my uncle go through dementia. I mean, he's been alive for eight years with dementia, but it's not him. It's just his body. So you're in the worst situation. Uh, I think the goal there is to make it as positive as possible. But someone's got to be the adult and speak up and say, guys, this is a waste of money. Yeah. It's going to be better for dad's care if we do this. Yeah. Right, Let's talk about last... something positive, y'all. We got to end on a positive question. Note. We have our yeah. last question, Matt. Yeah. So uh, this person says, I noticed Goodwill gives you a weird receipt now. I've seen this too. It's got like a QR code. How do you show what you actually give when you're doing your taxes for a donation? Uh, so you still got to write it down. Um, that QR code is really just, um, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but it's just, it's easier for you to scan and then go online and fill it out. You're still going to have to fill it out. So what I always do is I always take a picture of whatever I donate every single time. And then that way I can go back when I'm doing my taxes and write it out. So even if it's a small box or a whole room, take a picture. I do that for every client. I do it personally now. I actually donate about every other week now. It's easier than waiting to the end of the year. But take a picture and then write it down. I keep a spreadsheet of it. Um, the laws change every year, depending upon who's in charge of Congress. It is what it is. I'm not getting political. It's just a tax thing. It is what it is. So you got it. You need to have your accountant help you. Sometimes it's 3,500. Uh, I've seen families... Uh, when they're donating a whole house, get $85,000, like, but you've got to document it properly. So you just take your pictures. And then I would say, if it's more than the standard deduction, you're going to want to have your accountant help you do it because you don't want to do it the wrong way. But if you have that picture, you can go back and write it out. Right. Thank you so much, Matt. This has been great. And Matt and I want to thank all of you for joining us today and asking all your great questions. You can also register today to join us for our March webinar on March 15th at 11 a.m. Central for our next webinar to learn more about sleep and aging with Dr. Michael Bria. So you can register right now at that link, same link to go and register to win one of the books if you haven't done that yet. And each of our webinars features a different subject. You can visit brookdale.com slash in the know to discover more. And we hope we see you again soon. And until next time, we hope you all stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. You can do it. 10 minutes, get started. You can do it. Starting today. I'm starting today. Thank <laughs> you.